This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. This is a rebroadcast of Practical Prayer Podcast, episode number five, from the summer of 2021. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a New Thought Minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence, and I'm here with Reverend Bill Marcioni. Today, we're going to talk about what? Why the heck we're here? Why? How did these two unlikely people get onto this unlikely podcast together? I know. <laughs> so how did this happen? Well, I, you know, I have a story, and you have a story, and then there's an intersection story. So I will start by telling my incredibly short version of your story. Because it's so much easier for me to like gloss over <laughs> 35 fun-packed years on the Christian pulpit and just basically say that you grew up in the black Christian church and then took the helm as a pastor and a leader and a student and a teacher and eventually got to the point where you're, as you continue to broaden out your understanding of things, you found a resonance with the teaching of new thought which is what I've been involved in for a while. And then by a completely unlikely set of circumstances, you and I connected up, and you've been taking some classes and participating in my thing at New Thought Philadelphia. And the reason that, that I'm doing this is because I have spent so much time in New Thought that I don't understand a perspective from people who are not already inside the circle. Wow. So that's how this happened. Well, I think so. You tell my story now. Well... You told your story because I, you're like the person who's been in New Thought forever. And I can only tell it through my eyes. So well, that's what I want. I mean, you know, I can embellish with the rest of my story. We got a whole podcast and there's not really an end time. Okay, so let me say this. I studied and studied and studied on my own because that's what I do. And um, I'm reading and anything that somebody referenced, I would read. And so I have a strong, you know, reading discipline. Anyway, I got to a place where I thought that, or I knew I had gone as far as I could go by myself and I needed somebody to help me a little further, except I didn't know how to find somebody. And that's interesting because my, the first teacher that I learned from was Dr. Roger Teal on YouTube. And that was good for a while, but then I thought, you know, Hey, spirit. And, and that's the way I talk to spirit. Listen, I, I need you to bring me somebody that I can talk to, ask questions that will not judge me, but will help me understand things and just be kind of patient, you know, because I have a lot of questions. And I was scrolling on Facebook uh, one morning and this ad came up for a class. And this is this is really how I know it was God that brought us to this intersection because I never engage number one with any kind of ad or anything on Facebook. I just post stuff for my kids and what I do. And um, you were advertising a class and I took a chance and responded to you and didn't get anything back. So I said, look, I responded, you know, through, and you said, here, here's my phone number. And this is all in a matter of minutes. Here's my phone number. I called, and like you called me right back. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. That's why I said, oh, this is God, because I was expecting, number one, a phone tree, leave a message, figure out when you're going to call me back. I figured the whole process might take about two weeks. You called right back and you were just there was just something about the way you spoke. And there were certain words that you said 
that I knew were from spirit. Like, this is your guy. And um, we can talk down the road about how I thought, you're kidding. This is my guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your tall white guy. Yeah, yeah, I got a story about them, but you know, I I've gotten to a place now that I just trust spirit. Period. You know, even when it seems weird and highly unlikely, and so that's how I see the intersection. But but I, you know, when you said certain words, like I didn't look for your resume, I didn't ask you, you know, what school you went to or anything like that. I just trusted that spirit had brought you to me. And um, like you're this new thought genius, you know, like every question that I have asked so far, you have such a definitive answer. I haven't always agreed, but I don't disagree the way, because it's a broad brush statement. People normally disagree. If I disagreed, I set it to the side and said, okay, let me pretend that I'm wrong and try to figure out what this guy is talking about and approach it that way. So that way I'm not, you know, like going, I'm not having this tug of war. So I don't know. And maybe you didn't ask for all that, but um, to me, that was great. Yeah. To me, that's how it it started, you know? And um, so I, I trust spirit. Therefore I knew that I could trust your teaching. Is that cool? Well, thank you. And, and being a new thought genius, there's no pressure there. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but what I've learned over the years is that the teacher doesn't need to know everything. The teacher just needs to know a little more than the student. And for me, it's been a growth process as well. You know, I too was, uh, I, I grew up in a Christian household. We were Protestant and, you know, United, United Church of Christ. And my mom was a Sunday school teacher. And you know, I went to the confirmation classes and was in the choir and you know, spent a fair amount of time in the church. And uh, towards the end of the confirmation classes, I really soured on it. And two weeks before confirmation, after they'd already given me the Bible with the, you know, the date of confirmation in it, I told my parents, I can't do this. I could, and they said, well, why not? I said, because I don't believe it. And they said, well, what don't you believe? I said, well, there are two things. And when I was 12, so one of them was the virgin birth, which seemed really unlikely. But the other is, you know, I fully believe that Jesus was the son of God, but I couldn't believe that Jesus was the only son of God. How can there be that level of exclusivity? And so I asked them, I asked the people who were teaching the confirmation class, how can that be? And they said, you just have to trust that. And I said, everything else you have taught me depends on that being true. So if you take that card out from the bottom of the stack, everything falls down. I'm out of here. And to my great surprise, my parents didn't object. It was like, oh, he spent some time thinking about this. And it was really unusual because I was a middle child and I was rebellious and I kept being told no for lots of things, but that was not one of them. And so I, you know, I cast myself loose from the only religion or spiritual practice that I had and didn't really understand what the prayers were about either. Because, you know, begging for somebody outside of me to keep me from dying in the middle of the night seemed a little, a little harsh. And so I kind of wandered around in the spiritual desert for 20 years. And when I was in my mid thirties, uh, early thirties, I found, uh, you know, went back to church, went to a, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. They were wonderful. Wanted to have a place where we could do something for our daughter who was brand new at that point, but it got a, a little, it got done with that because they weren't talking about God much. Unitarian Universalism is wonderful, very wonderful social and a great fabric and fellowship is fantastic, but the, the, there wasn't a lot of meat on the bones. And a friend of mine recommended taking a look at uh, a religious science church. And my wife had been involved with some people who knew about religious science in her youth. And she says, oh yeah, science of mine, that's fun. And I took to that like a fish to water. And I realized that there were people who believed the same things that I believed. And I'd always believed them. I just didn't have a language for them. And they had a language for it. Some of it's arcane. Uh, They had songs. They had hymns. They had events and classes. And I just started doing it and kept going and going and going. And along the way, began to embrace all of the things that I find to be great about Christianity and about Buddhism and about Judaism. And then it turns out that in a part of the story, I knew that my mother and her family had escaped Germany 
1939. I did not find out the story until like a few years ago that in fact they had been a mixed faith family and my grandfather and grandmother and the whole family had been Jewish. And so my mother's mother's mother was Jewish in Germany and died in Auschwitz. And I have a connection there, uh, which is much more profound than I would have expected. And all religions, from what I can tell, have something really valuable to offer. And it's, it's broadened it out. By taking the new thought approach, I can cultivate whatever is good in any of them for me, and in a lot of ways, reshape the ideas. The magic for me about having you come along is because you grew up so steeped in the Christian tradition that I have a framework to lean the new thought teaching against. Well, that's interesting because when I came, I was <laughs> I was ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there had been so much disappointment and pain associated with um, the tradition through which I came. And um, I wasn't, sometimes when you're in, in a lot of pain and, and difficulty, it's like, just get rid of all of it. You know, I can't, I couldn't even fathom which part would still be valuable. Now, I was fortunate, though, in, in my come, raising, in my coming up, my mother was Baptist turned Pentecostal, and there was no wiggle room there for questioning. My father was Methodist, and he allowed my questions. You know, he allowed me to pursue thought and so forth. And I had an uncle who traveled around the world and he sent me books from India and so forth. So it's it's not like I had no exposure to thinking outside of traditional Christianity, but it really was not acceptable. Uh, in my Bible studies, everybody, I mean, from the very beginning of my pastoral tenure, everybody loved my Bible studies. And I would have more people in Bible studies, even from churches, from other churches, more than I would have on Sunday morning. And it's because of the way I taught. I had a metaphysical approach or interpretation. I didn't know what it was. I, I didn't. I just did it from a perspective of trying to make it real. And, and so you just get to a place where you say, no more. I, I have to find what's real, whatever that means, whatever resonates with me. So mm -hmm. here I am. Yep. And well, here. let's take a quick break and then come back and talk about babies and bathwater and what to keep. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy to understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence, and I'm here with Reverend Bill Marcioni. And today we're talking about how all this happened, how the two of us uh, ended up doing something like this. And you were talking earlier about uh, how unlikely it was that somebody would call you back as quickly as I did from the, uh, the Facebook outreach, whatever that happened to be, and the phone calls. And um, I can look on my calendar and, and determine exactly what date that was. Because when I got your Facebook message, I was at a funeral home. And I have spent precious little time at funeral homes during COVID. 
I was there because the sister-in-law of one of our practitioners had passed, and we went there for the viewing. And I was walking into the parking lot and getting into my car to head home, and there was this message from you. And so, you know, quickly traded back and forth. And I thought, well, I have time now. So I called you back because I was in the car. <laughs> so I drove home from the funeral with you <laughs> and had a very wide-ranging conversation. And it was completely intriguing to me because of the different ways that we had converged on the same teaching. And by the way, that's, you know, that's my mission is to be a beneficial presence, to take this bright light, which I consider to be the new thought teaching and hoist it up as high as I can so that people can see it because there are people who are looking for this. Absolutely. I'm a little, I'm almost choked up about what you said about hoisting this bright light because people need it. They so need it. And through the years, in pastoring, I saw such pain, disappointment, hope that wasn't really like hope. So many questions and people are afraid to question what they've been told and what they know. And how are you gonna ever get past where you are? How are you gonna get out of this this um, hole? Almost said something else. I <laughs> <laughs> How are you ever going to get out of a difficult situation? Now, hell on earth, you know, is, is another way of saying it. If you don't allow new thoughts to come in, or at least entertain new thoughts. And I was committed to that. You know, I saw it for so many years, people praying for the same thing over and over the same way. And I kept thinking, there's something missing here. Because if God loves us, God really loves us. And you know, there's this thing about if God loves us, why is there so much suffering? I always had a, an idea that I had a, a responsibility in this, in my own life in some way. I, didn't, I could not explain it from a new thought perspective, but for me, it was like, I need to take some sense of responsibility for this. And I will never forget one of the uh, papers that I wrote in seminary. It was, it came back to me and I, I was so proud of it because I just did a free flow of how I really thought because I thought I was in a place that I could do that. I got the paper back. It was a whole bunch of red lines and circles around it and question marks and so forth. And at the end, the professor said, there's just too much you that you think you have control over and not enough God. And I thought, Yep, I think that's what I was trying to say, you know. So hmm. it didn't go over well for the grade, but it went over well for me. <laughs> what the heck, you know? I mean, and let me tell you this. This is what I do. I, I was good at this. I did it over, right? I did a paper over. So I'll give you what you want. And so the grade so was... you did one for you and one for one, them. Yeah, but the one for me was the one that counted. And I'm glad for the moment because it allowed me to really explore some some questions and the fact that you are here in the way that you are and available, you know, probably not as visible as you should be, it will allow other people that have questions and may be fearful of asking those questions or not knowing or having a place to flesh those kinds of thoughts out. I just like am so moved by that. Hmm. You know. One of the things that you said is that God loves us so much, then why does God allow the level of suffering uh, that we experience? And that is a, it's a perennial question, and it comes up a lot. And it has to do with our own perceptions, our own experience of separation and judgment. So what's the thing that people usually think is the worst possible outcome in a situation? Dying, you know? People are going to die because of this. Well, if you extend the question, how could God let that happen? It's like, that's the way the system works. If you tried to get human life approved by the underwriter's laboratory, they'd never do it because it's a death trap. <laughs> <laughs> this planet is a death trap. Billions and billions of human beings, and there are only 7 billion left, they, they, they've been dying off for thousands of years, every last one of them. But that's the program. 
So if the worst possible thing that can happen is to die, which is the only thing that we can absolutely know for sure when somebody is born, the rest of it turns into a matter of timing and convenience. Mm -hmm. So it is possible for me to go through the entire rest of my life without ever stubbing my toe. At some point, I'm going to have a death experience. One's inevitable. One is uncomfortable, but might not have to happen. Why is it that I'm not much more concerned about the toe stubbing? And that's why I use the term judgment. Because we judge something to be bad or suffering and then blame God for it. And in fact, it's all a choice. I'm always free to choose. Now, I can't choose exactly what the outcome that I want to have is, but I can certainly change my beliefs and point myself in the direction of the good that I'm inviting and let go of my attachment to how it's going to happen. And that's the entire process of creating our new experience through our intentions. That's what practical prayer is all about. It's, about, it's a mechanism for changing our belief to allow a new experience to come in. So let's wind back for a second about um, the choice piece, because I think that is so critically important. When you talk about the worst thing that can happen being death, yes, but where certain people are, feet on the ground, you're going to die anyway. So nobody's really like, you don't want to die right now, but you're going to die. Right. Or and, uncomfortably. Yeah. And, and if you, you know, if you hook it up right, the way the church brings it to you, painting with a broad brush, of course, you secure your place in heaven. Okay. But the problem is right now. It's like between life and death. And so why do bad things happen between life and death? And you get this, you know, people always give you this list of things and horrors that they went through in their life, which always brought me to this one place about free will and the choice. And I always felt that if if that is true, then therein lies the answer to some of our problems and suffering. We have chosen, think, not chosen to suffer, of course, but have made choices that resulted in that suffering. And- Oh, it, I, yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and the choices of other people, either the ones who are living now or people who have set the framework for how we're engaging as a society uh, have created all of that and also set, set up the belief because we believe that that's the way things are. And so we behave accordingly. Exactly. And I think that um, with practical prayer, you know, when you introduced to me the, the portion, the part that's preparation or purpose, you know, that's when some lights came off from me because that's right where I am. That's where you're your choices are made. That's where you get to flush out your choices and to see whether they make sense or not. That's so important. And it's really, in, in my view, it's hard for me to get past that when I'm sharing with people because we're not used to the idea of choice and responsibility. And I think this kind of squarely puts us right there. You, you've got to take responsibility and acknowledge the piece of this mess that is created, you know, by self. Surely people before, before us have made choices that we've had to live with. And, you know, we make choices to undo that stuff. But also there are things that we do now that we make choices in our lives and it winds up like a hell, you know, but it's not like God did it to us. You know, and you get mad because God doesn't rescue you from this hell. I think you got to figure out maybe you're in it and you can get out of it yourself. I mean, and that's there's there's tons and tons of hours of teaching in that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the the important part and the way that it relates to practical prayer is when we get out of it ourselves or you can get out of it yourself, you're not getting out of it yourself. It's a co-creative process because, I mean, and, and everybody says this, as you believe, uh, so it shall be done unto you. It's done unto you as you believe. Your new life begins with a new thought. Change your thinking. Change your life. Our lives are an outpicturing of our belief system. So when we change our belief system, we allow or invite a new experience of our life to come in. Now, the, you're, you're currently really big on the purpose statement in a practical prayer. And that's great because that's one of the differentiators. And 
the rest of the detail is we are not asking an, a power outside of ourselves to do us a favor. We are identifying that infinite creative power that creates everything. And identify, since it has created everything, it created me. That's that only son of God thing that bothered me, mm -hmm. is Jesus did this. Jesus did practical prayer. He did one prayer that was a seven-step practical prayer or spiritual mind treatment in the Bible. And he didn't do it to achieve something specific. He actually did it like a software demo. He said, this is how you guys should pray. And every other prayer that he did, he didn't do all the steps. So Ernest Holmes kind of noticed that all religions use those steps. And, you know, and, and then we, I took the steps. That's what practical prayer is. Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray. And then he did a practical prayer. That's all I'm doing. After that manner, I am praying and teaching people how to pray. It was the Lord's Prayer. In the preamble to that, he said, uh, do not pray by vain repetition. And of course, we've been doing the Lord's Prayer in vain repetition, sometimes twice a service, <laughs> ever since. And I take what Jesus said pretty seriously. Like if he said to do something, then do that. And if he said, as it is done, as you believe, so it shall be done unto you, then, then he meant it. And what we're, going to, what we're doing in a practical prayer is partnering with that infinite creative power. You call it God, call it the creator, call it the Big Bang. It's all the same to create our new experience. But we have to do it by what we believe. Let's take a quick break and come back and do a prayer. Okay. You can put practical prayer to work in your life, and Reverend Bill Marcioni can help. He is offering an online class that teaches you to create your own practical prayer in five weekly one-hour sessions. The final hour brings your practical prayer together, anchored in live original music by a notable New Thought musician. Practical prayer is based on the most effective prayers found in religions and spiritual practices all over the world. Use it to deepen ever more fully into the truth of your spiritual nature. It's the core of a transformational spiritual practice that's simple, even if it's not always easy. Reverend Bill is also available for private spiritual counseling prayer sessions. Together, you'll lean into the challenges you've experienced in life and explore the transformation that's possible through practical prayer. You'll uncover old, hidden beliefs and uproot them to make way for the life of your dreams. Everything you need to know is on the website at b-v-light.com. That's b-v-light.com. We're back. This is the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence, and I'm here with Reverend Bill Marcioni. And today we're going to close with a prayer. And, and this one, actually, this is going to be fun because we've been talking about how the two of us got together and kind of the framework for growing into and evolving with the idea of using practical prayer to create the experience in our life. And part of it is that belief system, that willingness, that openness to accept that this works. And the other part is all of the just joyous, fun, rich goodies that show up once we start creating that new experience in our life. So what I'd like to do for the purpose of this prayer is what you would refer to as a light bulb moment. So for everybody who's listening to have a light bulb moment about, oh, this is how it works, and this is how it works in my life. And I'm going to include that the light bulb moment will be completely enjoyable. Because the universe is willing to teach us through pain. We just we don't, we don't need to invite that. Mm -hmm. So let's join together in knowing that there is one creative power that creates everything. It's God, it's spirit, it's nature, it's the Big Bang. In the beginning, there was just the one. Darkness and void and God. And then the one had an intention. Or it exploded. Or it said, let there be light. And the creative law, the creative laws of the universe, the natural laws of the universe began creating everything that exists everything that exists everywhere. All of the energy and all, all of the particles have been there since the beginning of time, continuing to interact and unfold and connect with each other in ways that bring newness and freshness and expansion into the world. In the beginning, there was that energy and it was all 
nuclear reactions uh, exploding and creating the elements that exist now and continuing to form the star stuff that formed itself into planets and stars and galaxies and continue to unfold and reveal itself as life, as everything that exists on our planet, everything that exists everywhere in the universe, is that one sharing itself in a unique and particular way. And I use the word particular because it's the particles that have formed together to create the experience that we're having. That same creative power has created me, has created Carol, has created everybody who is listening to this prayer. Everything is that divine presence taking its own particular form. And because the intelligence with which I think, the consciousness with which I am aware, also came from that one, I know that it is that same consciousness, that same intelligence that I am accessing and using. So all of that creative power, all of that divine goodness, all of the possibility that exists anywhere, exists everywhere. And it exists for me and everyone who is listening to this practical prayer right now. I know that as bright lights of that divine love, we are shining and sharing ourselves in a way that is unique and rich and wonderful. And I am claiming to the greatest degree possible that for each of us and for all of us, a new and deeper awareness of that creative power is coming into our experience. It's showing up in joyous and delightful ways, bringing something wonderful and rich and delightful and unexpected to us. An aha moment, a light bulb going off, realizing, noticing, understanding that this would not necessarily have happened without the invitation, without the openness, without the willingness for it to. So that's the shift in consciousness, the willingness to invite more prosperity into our lives through unexpected channels, for more love to come into our relationships, the ones that exist now, and new friendships that are showing up, new experiences of health and comfort and vitality in our physical bodies, more well-being, more of that delightfulness in our physical experience, more creativity, more joy, more harmony in our work, and a deeper, more profound sense of connection to spirit during our spiritual practice. It shows up in any of these ways or all of these ways for each of us, for all of us, in ways that are obvious to each, delightful in our experience, and bring an even deeper and more profound understanding of the value and the delight of this creative process. That's what I'm claiming. It seems like a big ask. It's a big universe. It's not a big ask. It's a little bit of delight showing up in a bunch of people's lives. So that's what I'm claiming. And I'm claiming it with gratitude, thankfulness for the awareness of this process, thankful for the willingness of each one listening to allow that light bulb to go off, to allow more good into our lives, to be willing to consider this new story. I'm grateful for all of this good. And with this feeling of thanks deep in my heart, I speak this word of intention and I release it into that same creative law that has created everything. It's now creating this. I let it be. I know it's so. So it is. So it is. You know what? Yeah, you're like this new thought genius. Because <laughs> I was listening to the prayer, and um, I listened two ways. One in the spirit of prayer, and the other one, it's always a learning. You know, like it's a lesson in it for me. So sometimes I'm struggling, like, you know, stop trying to learn, just listen, right? Then I'll say, listen, you can pray later, learn. This is what he's saying. And sometimes you're way up here, like way up here. And and that's cool because I'm going to catch up because that's, that's what I want to do. Practical Prayer Podcast with Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Reverend Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org.
This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.